Hello. I hope you're all well. Nothing prepares you for your first Leica, whether it's a Leica 3 or a Leica M. No amount of 4K video or Purple Pros prepares you. I counted at least 200 videos on YouTube about Leica 3 cameras. What I thought I'd do today was talk about the things that nobody talks about or the things that are just myths. Before we talk about that, let's just talk about the size of this camera. It's much smaller than you think. As an example, the camera isn't very much bigger than five 35 millimeter cassettes. The first thing to talk about is what you might call fit and adjust and film loading. Now, I know that sounds very esoteric, but as many of you are aware, people who collect vintage Leicas draw a line in the sand at 1976. Before 1976, Leica cameras were assembled and then the parts were fitted and adjusted so that the camera worked to specification. The notion is that with fit and adjust you can make the camera more accurate whether that's true or not, that's the idea. Okay, so what has fit and adjust got to do with film loading? As you may know, a Leica 3 requires you to cut a very long leader. But there are people on the internet who will tell you that you don't need to cut such a long leader. You can use just an ordinary film leader and you can load it into the camera. There are videos about this. Evidently, they can load the camera that way. Fit and adjust means that although the same parts are used in the camera, they aren't all exactly the same inside. Each Leica 3 is very subtly different. Some people will load the camera using just ordinary film with the leader uncut, and then they will open the camera, well, remove the lens, they'll put the camera onto time, they'll operate the shutter, the shutter will open, then they'll stick their finger into the camera and move the film around until it's properly seated. Now I can tell you from my camera, if I put the film in without cutting a leader, it won't even seat properly, let alone go down and get chewed up in the film gate. I have to cut a leader of the right length. In fact, if I cut the leader as recommended, that is to 10 centimeters, the film will jam and won't go through. It took me the better part of a day or 24 hours of fiddling about to realize or to find a solution and that was I had to cut a leader that was instead of 21 sprockets long which is about 10 centimeters I had to cut a leader that was 24 sprockets long. So when I fit it into the camera there's an excess of film on the take-up spool. I then rewind the film with the lever in the reverse position until it's snug. Then I close the base, put the lever into the advance, and then the film will wind on. That leads us to the second thing that nobody talks about, and that is film fragments in the film gate. Because the back of the camera doesn't open and you have to slide the film in from the side, if there's any rough spot on the film or any sharp angles, these can break off. And if they break off, it's very hard to remove them without disassembling the camera. You can try to put a piece of very thin cardboard, such as you might get out of a parking meter. S sweep the cardboard backwards and forwards until any film debris falls out. But if you're unlucky, you'll have to send the camera off to be disassembled and to be cleaned to remove those bits of film. You stand the risk of damaging the shutter and once you've damaged the shutter, uh, an expensive replacement or repair. So the moral of the story for those first two things that nobody talks about is you can't force the film into the camera 
you have to find out how your camera actually takes film and be careful that you make sure that all of the edges are fully rounded and that there are no loose bits or sharp edges on the film leader as you take it up. The third thing that nobody talks about is that the lens cap isn't there to protect the front element of the lens. Invariably, the damage that's caused to the camera by leaving off the lens cap at an appropriate time is burning a hole in the shutter. Now, I've heard people say, well, I'll just put it down to f16 and I'll try to make sure that I don't point the lens at the sun um, or I'll leave the lens in a, in a collapsed position, so I'll collapse the lens and that way it won't burn a hole in the shutter. Photographs of Henri Cartier-Bresson, his lens cap was attached to the neck strap or the, the camera strap so that once he'd finished shooting, he'd pop the lens cap back on. The manual in fact says that if you are winding the, uh, rewinding the film in the camera, it's important to put the lens cap back on. Now, the fourth thing that people tend to talk about is how slow it is to operate the camera. So, um, you're left with the impression that it is a sort of a doddering old camera and um, be kind to it because you don't want it to fall over and hurt itself. Well, I did some tests. Because it doesn't have a mirror, the shutter operates as soon as you press the button. So I have some high-speed footage here. When you press the shutter button, you'll see that the Leica shutter is moving before the Nikon FM2 shutter. The mirror still has to get out of the way. Now, under what circumstances can we make them the same? Well, if you pre-press the Nikon shutter so that it's halfway down, so the meter is operating, you can feel the resistance of them halfway down, and then you press the two together, you can see that the Nikon shutter is operating at about the same time as the Leica shutter. If you're just grabbing shot, the Leica shutter is going to be operating of a fraction of a second faster than the Nikon shutter. The other way that people think of this as a doddery old camera is that, first of all, you have to look through a viewfinder to frame, and then you look through a rangefinder, so the rangefinder is right next door. That allows you to focus, but then you look through the viewfinder again, and then you take your picture. Somebody using some other modern camera has again already have taken the shot. When you are wind on, it's not just a smooth movement of a lever. It's at least four creaks of the wind-on button. But that's if you're trying to use it like a modern camera. If you're thinking of the camera as a tool for reactive photography. You know, you walk down the street, you see something, you lift up your camera, all the automation goes on, bang, 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 and you've taken your picture. Whereas, if you're using the camera in a predictive sense, that is, you're walking along, you see the light change, you adjust the camera, you see things happening, you adjust the focus, and then when something happens, you lift the camera up to your eye, it's already been wound on, and you take the picture. So here are a few more things. I've seen in some videos where people claim that if you adjust the shutter before you wind on, you will destroy the camera. If you've adjusted the shutter speed before you wound on, then once you've wound on, adjust the shutter speed to the speed that you want. The reason is quite simple. The shutter dial rotates while the exposure is being taken, but it doesn't return to the same place as it did when you took the photograph. So if you adjust the shutter speed before you wind on, the shutter speed that you have afterwards will not correspond to the shutter speed that you wanted. So that's why you adjust the shutter speed after you've wound on the camera. The other thing about the shutter is it's not particularly quiet. I know there's all sorts of things written about how quiet a Leica shutter is, and it's claimed that the Leica 3s have a quieter shutter than the Leica M's. But if you want real silence, you use an iPhone or use an electronic shutter on a mirrorless camera because they actually make no noise at all. When you look at the sound intensity, 
the intensity of the sound in decibels for the Leica shutter versus the Nikon shutters is the same. About 40 decibels above background, and in this case the background is a quiet room. The big difference is the length of time that you hear a sound. So the Leica shutter sound goes for a shorter time duration than the Nikon shutters. Obviously there's the mirror, the sound of the mirror moving around. And so it will attract more attention, but it's not quieter in decibels. The other thing about single lens reflexes is that if the person you're photographing is looking at the camera and they're looking at the lens, they will see the movement of the mirror and the movement of the aperture blades inside the lens. So there's not only an auditory signal, there's also a visual signal that you've taken a photograph. Whereas with the Leica, there's only the sound, and if somebody was looking at the lens, they would see no movement at all. So it's more unobtrusive, that's for sure, but it's not so unobtrusive that you are invisible or that people don't hear you when you're taking photographs. One more thing, when people talk about the viewfinder on this camera, they say it is set for a 50 millimeter lens. But when you look through it, you realize that the angle of view is more than 50 millimeters. It's not quite 35 millimeters, but it is definitely not 50 millimeters. You can compare this to either the viewfinder on the top of the camera, it doesn't correspond exactly to the, um, or take um, an SLR and stand in the same place and focus on the same scene and you'll see that the viewfinder is not. So if you just use the camera and you use the viewfinder on this and then you see but that doesn't really look like what I took a photograph of then first of all there's going to be the parallax error because the viewfinder window isn't directly over the lens so everything's off to one side and secondly this lens is, the viewfinder is capturing more of the scene. So if you're using the viewfinder, don't put anything critical near to the edges because chances are it won't be in the picture. So you might ask, why did I buy one? Well, it was really because of this photograph, if I can just show you. I saw this photograph a very long time ago, maybe 30 years ago. And, um, you know, it's brilliant lighting. But um, if you've ever held a camera up to your face, you know that um, they don't all look that pretty. I mean, this is a lovely camera, but it gives you a completely different view of your face. And if you put this camera in front of your face, it's a lot smaller. And if you do this, then it looks like a creature with two eyes. So that's pretty fabulous, just on looks alone. Of course, when the Leica 1 came out, it was seen as being something that um, a woman would put into her handbag to take snaps with, but real men would use much bigger cameras, 4x5 Graflexes or view cameras or Rolleiflexes or something big. And was once this had revolutionized photography that um, it's now become an object of veneration to all camera collectors. Here's a picture of a man. I think he's quite famous. He has his camera bag, which is probably no bigger than a woman's handbag in which he normally carried two camera bodies, three lenses and a few rolls of film. This picture, by the way, is taken in the 1960s in Cuba. And this gentleman was still using his Leica 3. He was also using a Leica M. There are plenty of pictures of him using a Leica M, but he used the Leica 3 all the way till the time he stopped shooting. This camera has its advantages. That gentleman, as you can see from this picture, was still using collapsible lenses on his Leica M4. 
a close look at the lens indicates it's a Leica Suma, so an f2 lens from basically before the second world war will this become my everyday carry well none of my cameras pushes the other cameras out of the way they all have film in them and i use them on rotation so this will just fit into the rotation of of cameras i'll get to learn its peculiarities more but for now um, thank you for listening and i hope you have a good day What you need to protect the front element from the lens is how to clean the lens properly because if you don't clean the lens properly you'll scratch the front element. But almost 